You know that WhatsApp chat group? Is every one of is every one of you on that chat group? I don't mean everyone who's here. I'm not talking about who's here. I'm not talking about you individually. I'm talking about your group. Are you responsible for your group? Yes, you are. Thank you. So is everybody in there? How many members are there? Where's Anne? 35? So we're missing three at least. Who are they? So who's on there, who's not on there? Let's find out who's missing. Because is it does it matter if you're on the chat group, Camila? Why? Does it help? Yeah, and who knows what else, right? Nothing is straightforward in this world, including this class. So we need each other to succeed. We can't really figure out who's not on because not everyone's pictures. So it's kind of to figure out who is. Okay, let's do this. Let's um, let's uh, send a message with our name in it to the chat. You can also just name your profile. Does that work? I, I thought you. Everyone. You yeah. see everyone's name because you already have them in your profile, right? I don't have a thing any. So, like, it has like a little squiggly line. I know there's a name. But there's like. Oh. Yeah, there's like. There's like old Hollywood movies. There's like 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 in a text message to the whole group. So I'm it, sorry for it'd the- It would be useful to go to settings and name yourself on settings. Yeah. Well, I'm named on settings, but you don't yeah. have my name, do you? Yeah, I have your name. I think it's your name. Oh. There's people who haven't named themselves on settings. Well, what's wrong with that? Okay, everybody, if you haven't named yourself on settings, Megan, Christina, if you haven't named yourself on settings, please do so, so we can see who's in. We're trying to get everyone into the WhatsApp group. Are you guys in? Uh, I'm not. In. No, I don't think so. Anna. Anna. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh, thank you. So you see my name, right? So I don't have to send it. As long as you name yourself, it shows up in the, in the list. So please, everyone, name themselves. Who's not named? Anna just says Anna. Caitlin, it just says Caitlin. Shouldn't it say Caitlin German? Why? I mean, we all know right in the and that's who she is. Well, how about Mike and Michael? Which I one of you is I Mike and Michael? I like, I feel like I can do it. <laughs> which one is Mike and which is Michael? Easy question. Michael? Yeah. Or, <laughs> or just look at it. <laughs> <laughs> So we just have to say Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Driscoll, right? <laughs> I guess. So who whose name do we need? You tell us. We don't know because we don't. Okay. Tell us the first, the last three, last four digits of the phone number. Okay, but we so here's why. Here's the second reason why on Halis, but that's not how you say it, right? Angelis. <laughs> your your dad calls you on Halis. Huh? Your dad calls you on Halis. No, wasn't my dad calls me on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so there are two reasons we need your name. One is to make sure everyone's on. So no one gets left behind. Uh, the second reason, uh, well, I, the reason we need everyone is because we now want to invite everyone who's in the summer 23 urbanism group to join the urbanism group. There is a larger group and we share important news items. That's another rhyme. Yeah. Is it is it like part of our grade to be in this other group chat? 
No, but it's important for your career. It's more important than grades. It's more important than grades. This is about career success. It's, it's, uh, you don't have to be, but I'd like to get everyone. I'd like to send everyone an invitation. You can take it up or not. You can silence the group and just check in once a year to see what's happened in the past year. But um, for example, there's lecture content that is brand new this year that I'm including because last Tuesday, there was a news article in the New York Times that covers so much of the key principles that we need to grapple with in this course. And I wanna share it with anyone. I wanna share it with everyone. I wanna share it with everyone once. So I wanna share it to the larger urbanism group. And I want you to have an opportunity to benefit from that in case you're interested in it. We're gonna do a term project at the end of the semester. No secret. Um, it's more or less the same as what you do already, just a little bit more independent, a little bit more in depth, a little bit more writing. But the term project is up to you to identify a topic that you find personally to be important to yourself and to your colleagues. You think it's going to be significant for your deeper dive. And so as you think about those things, it's not crazy to check out the traffic on the urbanism WhatsApp chat group because we have multiple faculty members and multiple students, including some alumni who you might be asking for jobs in a few years to pay off student loans, right? That, that is all in your future. This is not graded, it's more important than that. It's career success, okay? Any questions about what's that? So when we get everyone on, we're just gonna make sure everyone's on. Andrew, so you're gonna continue that role as our administrator. So we're asking everyone to add their names to the profile so Angelise can identify who's not on, invite, make sure we're being inclusive of everyone. Then she will signal me and I will send an invitation to the whole group. Is it part of our grade to be part of this workshop? No. So then why do we have to make sure that everyone's on it? Like if they don't want to be on it. Nazi. Yeah. Nazi. Yeah. Nazi. Um, it's not part of your grade. Uh, I just want everyone to have the opportunity. You don't have to be part of this group. You don't have to be part of the larger group. Just want to make sure everyone has a fair shot at, at all the benefits of that. The networking. And what could possibly be the benefit of this group? Well, in a way, it is one of those moments of truth. Remember I referred to the moments of truth when our careers rise or our careers fall? It boils down to whether when the room, when the eyes in the room turn to you and they expect you to say something useful, clear, and actionable, you do that. And that's kind of what tweets are, where it used to be. It's kind of what social media, the, it provides us with moments of truth. Either we alienate the audience or we, they perk up and say, wow, that was a really sharp comment. I really appreciate the input of that person. And you make an impression that actually can have consequences for your career trajectory. So. There's something potent and powerful about identifying uh, a story that you run into in your daily digital lives. And you say, oh, I think my tribe of urbanism concentration people will find this interesting. I'm going to share it and I'm going to write one sentence that is, the, what's the purpose of that one sentence that you're sharing along with the link? The purpose of that one sentence is to identify the essence, the takeaway, the key takeaway message from that larger piece that you think your colleagues will find interesting, useful, 
actionable and may actually start a larger conversation, it may start uh, a direction for design uh, intervention. Does that sound familiar? It's the takeaway. We're practicing for success in the real world. Um, that's what we're doing. Okay. So here we are, as we have been before, and you know what I'm about to say. And I say it, I can say it a lot of different ways um, each time, if that's useful. Um, who's, um, who's just fine, everything's fine in this world. Everything's great. Okay. That's another way to ask the same question. Who's not fine? Who's, who's a little, a little concerned? Let's put it that way. Who's a little concerned? Okay. Sometimes your concerns have nothing to do with this class. Sometimes your concerns have to do with either the struggle of taking this class or the struggle of being a designer in a world where these issues are at play. Those are the two categories of concerns that we wanna hear about now. And you had the benefit of reading this long thing about what we used to call informal settlements. And one of the parts of the sketch writing exercise was for each of you to come up with a target question for further investigation on this topic. Some of you came up with target questions that <clears throat> either you don't have much faith in or you're just shy or you're too tired, you're not gonna share it with us. But others of you have the confidence, you worked hard at this, you worked hard at coming up with the target question and what? This is part of it. Yeah. Okay. Some of you worked hard for coming up with a useful target question, and you're not you're not shy about sharing. Them. So the first category is, um, I need I need to do better. Maybe it's about grading. Um, I need to do better in this course. I have some questions. Who's who's got one of those? You're fine. Are we, you're fine with that. The assignment is okay with you. No, it's so confusing. It's so confusing. It's so okay, and, let's go. And every time I ask some, like anyone in this room, they're like, "I'm just as confused as you are." So Hit me. It just the way it's worded, the way it's formatted. It, I know. Do really you have a question? Yes. Why are you saying we know if you ask? What? Like she's she's telling you that there's like an issue. You're saying I know the issue. I know the issue. No, I don't know the issue. I'm trying to support your success so that it's not an issue anymore. If there's an issue, then there's some action to be taken. She just identified the issue. You said what is the issue? The format, the way. The format. Worded. So the format. I'm not, I don't know. I need something, what specific wording? I'd say that it seems like the assignment and the grading is more based on the format that the assignment in and less about the content. It's not about the content. It's, it's, about, it's not about architecture. It's not about architecture. It's more about English writing. It's not about the assignment. Ah. Wow, okay, that's useful. So, like, specific for the format for like the takeaway questions, could there be like an overarching takeaway question for a whole section, or like should each person have one that they take away from? Both. When you are with your group and you're working through your, how many pages were you guys doing this week? Four pages. So, you're in with your partners, you're doing those four pages, and you're distilling down from four pages down to something much, much smaller. You're, and that's so that you and your colleagues can quickly access the content 
without having to reread the whole finding and rereading the whole article. Is that clear? That's the purpose of this. Um, uh, if you, if it were useful to take, once you worked your way through the four pages and you come up with a page and a half of sketch writing notes with a clear diagrammatic uh, diagram, kind of a, an outline diagram of, of what it looks like as a set of ideas. That's the outline. Um, now just boil it down to one sentence. Let's say you had to take those four pages and condense it to one sentence. What would that one sentence be? That's what you and your partners are heading towards so that your friends don't have to read the whole thing. They can just read the one sentence takeaway. We trust you to find what's important in those four pages. So far, so good. So that's the takeaway for each of the four page sections. One of the reasons that takeaway is so useful to your classmates is because every individual in the class is also required to write, to produce a one sentence takeaway that covers the entire reading. Is that a surprise thing? That's what it says, right? So what do you mean? Like you mean like the whole 25 page read? Yes. Okay. The whole 25 page read. Why would that be useful? It's useful because this should sound familiar. It's exactly what we were just talking about when someone who took this course three years ago and is now out in the working world and they see an article that they think would be of interest to the larger urbanism group in this WhatsApp chat, they typically will write one sentence of what they think is useful about that whole thing. And if the other 43 people in the group find it interesting, that one sentence takeaway, they're not just going to click on the link and read it. They're going to be very grateful to the person who wrote that very useful one sentence takeaway and shared it with the whole group. That's a recipe for career success. Is that starting to make sense in the larger context? Camila. Um, I'd like to understand what you were talking about. Thank so you. The takeaway. Um, which is from the group, and it's the only takeaway that of the group is of the whole week. No. Uh, no. If you have two people you're working with, and you're working on four pages together, the three of you are responsible for producing a one sentence takeaway for your four pages. I heard you say and then, and then the second one is the individual takeaway that you are responsible for writing that covers the entire reading. The Brightspace PDF. The Brightspace PDF takeaway, the individual uh, component. Does that make sense? It's also one that the takeaway is after the entire reading and the target questions, which are right below that, is before the entire reading. You mean in time or position on the page? Um, it's not in chronological order, which is why it's kind of confusing. Right. So the takeaway you do after you do the entire reading, the target questions you do before you do the entire reading. There are two target questions. There are questions that we ask ourselves before we engage the reading. And that helps us identify what matters for us as we engage it, because we don't we don't have time to just read the whole thing. No one's got time for that. It helps some self-respect. Don't spend too much time on this assignment. The way, the secret weapon to not spending too much time on this assignment is to know what you're looking for so that you can actively engage the reading without having to read the whole thing as if everything's important. 
because not everything is important. So that's the first set of target questions. Second set of target questions are after you do everything and you're getting, you're like, you're getting ready to come here on Thursday and you have questions. Yes. And that's the individual one takeaway question we want from you. And that's the one that we invite you to offer at the beginning of the class on Thursday. Is it okay for you to show us Sure. So in the assignment, we see it in two ways. We see the example that I have always given students in the past, which is this one. So this is the example it's in, you've seen it before, right? This is all guidance. Do, do not include this in your version of it. This is just helping us guide. What is this? What is that? What is this? It's just labeling what each of these things are. It looks this way, and thank you, Camila, for helping me understand the student perspective better. It looks this way because the source looks this way. You know how you diagram, you know, you can diagram Villa Savoie. I'm going to diagram Villa Savoie. You've seen them a billion times, so it's okay to you recognize that, right? It's a simplistic diagram of something that's actually pretty rich and complex, right? Um, this is the same thing. The reading uh, that we're going to dive into called The Color of Law is rich and complex. It doesn't follow a strict formula of here's something important under a heading, and then there's a second heading, and then here's something else important. Under each heading, there are lots of different important things. And they, for us, we wish it had more headings so we could quickly access the ideas. So when we sketch right, we add more headings. And we put those in brackets to signal to others, I made up this heading. This is not the author's heading. This is me, the sketch writer's heading. This is me, the sketch writer's connections, questions, and speculations. These are tools for quickly and effectively making sense of a fairly rich, complex reading, ignoring the things that don't matter and boiling it down to those things that do matter. Okay, so the format ends up looking like a diagram. It's like a cartoon version of this reading that has big blocks of text, right? And maybe a heading every five or six pages, right? When I look at it, when I open a book and I see a heading every five or six pages and big blocks of text, I go, oh, I guess I'm gonna to have to read the whole thing. But when I see something formatted like this, I say, oh, look, I'm looking for uh, the part that I think was in the source where they talk about, um, where the author talks about zoning, mixed use zoning, what we used to think of mixed use zoning. I'm looking for that part. So I'm looking, I look at the headings, I look at the bold fonts, and I, I'm quickly going through, uh, is that considered a local me mechanism? I'm not sure, uh, and I go through, and then I see here, aha, mixed and predominantly black neighborhoods were zoned for industry and toxic waste, but it had residential in it. So that was a mixed use zone and that was against the law. And so that's how zoning operated uh, against uh, certain people's interests, right? So it's a, it's a, 
it's a tried and true method that has been developed over centuries for how to make sense of a complex reading and boil it down to something you can access more quickly. It's the reason we take notes, and I don't know if everyone takes notes, but it's the reason we used to take notes in school. And so what was that? You know, because our memories are not superhuman. This is a way to quickly go back and access the thing we knew back in the summer of 2023 and wish we still knew it. You can access it this way. Does that help? Other questions? That's the format. I think that's the format question. Did I address the format question? Why? So now let's talk about this one. What does this have to do with architecture? Aha. Uh -huh. Grade it not based on the content, but based on the way. I grade it not based on the content, but on the way it's formatted Perfect. and written. Yeah. Why would I do such a thing? So uh, it turns out that what we've learned over the decades and in our careers, and I'm speaking for the faculty of the architecture program, what we've learned that there are skills that help us be effective in our jobs as designers. And uh, some schools teach those skills, other schools don't. We wanna be one of the schools with successful graduates. We want our graduates to rise up through the ranks and take leadership positions more quickly than the graduates of other schools. And turns out that's true, we've succeeded. Wentworth graduates move up in firms more quickly than the graduates of other programs. This is part of the reason why we teach these skills so that you have an easier time of facing the challenges of the workplace and succeeding. Remember the example of when, maybe it was on a Tuesday. Caitlin, when I used you as an example of the boss put a stack of things on your desk, is that a Tuesday? Yeah. Okay, so for those of you in the, more, the eight o'clock class, um, when the boss puts a stack of paper on the conference room table, on Friday afternoon at 4.30 and says, you know, Nazik, uh, Monday morning, I want you to give us a report on what we need to know from this stack of paper. But, and so what does Nazik do? Does she panic? Because her best, she's posting her best friend's baby shower on Sunday and she's got to get ready for that. She doesn't have time this weekend. Does she panic? No. She didn't panic because she's got these skills. So what does she do? She takes her post-it notes. She sits down on Saturday morning because she's got, she's got three hours on Saturday morning. The first thing she does is she rifles through the documents on the stack and identifies which ones are most important and which ones are less important. Then she might quickly look at the less important ones and identify two or three pages with post-it notes that actually are important. And then she takes the six documents, six books that are remaining, and she quickly goes through the table of contents, uh, zeroing in on exactly the things that are gonna be most important and ignoring the rest. Ignoring the rest is one of the most powerful tools at your disposal. And how many people tell you that before? Teachers are not in the habit in the old industrial age model of encouraging you to ignore anything. There's no such thing as knowledge that we don't wanna cram into you. That's the old way. The new way is we want to empower you as intelligent, critical thinkers to not absorb everything, to quickly identify what matters and what doesn't matter, 
And then when you've identified what matters, how did you identify what matters? Target questions. What are the questions that your group expects you to shed light on on Monday morning? Those are your target questions. You go in and after an hour of engaging this stack of materials, Nazik has marked the sections that are worth looking at. And because she has these skills, she's not gonna read. She's not even gonna pretend that that's even possible. She's gonna spend another hour on the most important of those things that she's given a priority. She's gonna write out post-it note points and put them on a whiteboard, or she's gonna use Google Docs, or she's gonna do something else, note cards or something else. She's gonna use her skills as a designer uh, this way to quickly and flexibly organize the information so that it goes from the sketch writing form to a form where she can report out. And then on Monday morning, she can report uh, before the meeting starts, her friends can ask her, so how was the baby shower you were all worried about? Oh, it was great. I, I, I spent all of Saturday afternoon decorating and picking stuff up from, from Wegmans and then Sunday it went on and on. And, but wait, oh my God, what about the report you're about to give? I did it, right? She did it, of course she did it. She has these skills. She knows what's important, what's not important. She did it in three or four hours on Saturday morning and she had the rest of her weekend. She's getting promoted and Jimmy is going to be left behind. Right? No one's named Jimmy. Right? Does that make sense? That's why this matters. Is, is, this is a secret weapon for career success. Every college student should have these skills. Every designer, especially, needs these skills because designers. You know, other, other topics, like if you're not in mechanical engineering, if you were in mechanical engineering, you would have your three pages of statics and mechanic and material property, you know, you'd have your material science. The, the knowledge of a mechanical engineer is tidy. It fits in a, in a notebook that you can master it and you have a very quick career. But I think you're getting the sense that designers in the pursuit of asking the question, what's up with that? Why is the world the way it is? Why is the United States like this and uh, Austria like that? What, what's going on here? There is no limit to the territory that we are expected to explore in, in architecture. And so this is particularly crucial skill set to have for success in the, a career in architecture. It helps to succeed in the thesis program. It will help you succeed in studio uh, in every class you take from here on. And you know maybe you're not convinced, um, but you don't need to be. It's a requirement of the course for a reason. It's a requirement of the course because this course is a prerequisite for everything that comes next in the concentration. Okay. So that's, there must be other questions that emerge out of that. No. So that's the sketch writing assignment. Everybody's clear and uh, ready to tackle the next one uh, next week because you're going to do it again. You're going to do better next week than you did this week. Why would you do better next week than you did this week? What questions could we answer for you? What clarifications could we provide to make sure you do better next week? I have one more question. Uh, in the situation that we had this week where the reading included the prologue as well as a chapter. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, the first one is um, when we do the notes, citations, and bibliographies, 
Mm -hmm. I focus it on just the chapter and not the prologue. Is that mm -hmm. how that would go? If there's multiple chapters, how do we call, do we have to do multiple bibliography citations for multiple chapters? Uh, the last question is no. Okay. This is one. Typically, when uh, the information that you put in your report uh, included something really important from chapter one or the prologue, in the bibliography, you just put the book because okay. the whole book is kind of resonating with these same points. The book is considered the source that you include in the bibliography. The note citation is a different, has a different purpose. The bibliography is something that you put at the end of your writing and says, this was a source that I referred to in the production of this work. The book is the thing. Last week, the chapter was the thing that that author wrote. This week, the book is the thing that goes in the bibliography. When you have a note citation, it's a different function. It's a different purpose. I can write, um, let's say it's 2035, and your firm is designing an extension to the campus uh, of pick a place in the world. London. OK. Um, well, that wouldn't probably be a footnote for this book. Let's say it's El Salvador. Um, the, it turns out that the campus uh, is on the outskirts of the city, and the extension requires the acquisition of land that currently has squatters on it. Um, there might be a reference to, you might make the suggestion, step one, grant full title deed rights to, to the residents of the squatter settlement. Step two, offer to purchase their land for a fair market value. And you want to support that suggestion with um, saying, I'm not making this up. This isn't me. Right. This isn't, uh, you know, this is my idea. This is a program by Hernando de Soto. And uh, that he put forward in the Mystery of Capital and was written about in on page 237 of uh, this book, the New Earth book. So where did this idea come from? It came from page 37 of this book, right? So that the note citation says, this is where the idea came from in the book. That's part of the reason why um, this, the insistence on the page numbers, because uh, there is no time in life to go back and figure out what page that was on. You need to put the page, if something is important enough to capture in the sketch writing, then it's important enough to note the page location. You know, it might be page 237 to 39 because he writes about it a lot. And you have that in your sketch writing and you can just drop that in as a footnote to the report uh, for your team. Okay, does that make sense? I predict. You all did better this week than last week. I predict you will do better next week than you did this week. And I can assert that you are doing better now than any prior group did at this point in the semester. So it's working, whatever it is. I'm sorry for, your, for the tone of frustration, but this is valuable stuff. We ask you to trust us, but we invite your criticism along the way. You don't have to wait till the end of the course when you do course evaluations. That's too late to help you. Let's do something about the course right now and make it work better. 
that's asked the questions to get the clarification we need this week and not wait till next week when I'm going to get another bad grade, right? So I support this. I invite this. Is this working? Okay. What other questions do you have? Are you going to do better next week than you did this week? Okay. How about that analysis thing? So the more immediate future, by the time you leave class today, I recommend that you've identified one or two or three possible projects to explore through your analysis that you are expected to do between now and Tuesday, same as last week. Except this week, we want you to add a footnote citation uh, in your um, in your five sentence main body of your paragraph. We want you to support the logical sequence of points, not just with the evidence provided by the visual evidence, but also to reinforce it and go elsewhere, go beyond what's available in the image. So you, now you can say something like, this site of this library park used to be a prison. That's not evident in the image, but it's important to your argument. Now we invite you to include that, to reinforce the point you're making, and then footnote the source of the information where you learned that it was a prison. Okay? Any questions about the analysis? You don't have to do a video. You do have to do a footnote, and you do have to do the caption according to the guidelines of the sign. Does it include monuments? Does it include monuments? Can you do monuments? You can do monuments. This week's topic of self-built communities tends to not include monuments, but it might. Good. Do you have an example in mind? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now let's get to the next kind of questions. If you were going to get something valuable out of this week's lecture, it would answer the question. What question would it answer? Don't start taking it easy on me now. Give me some hard questions that would increase the likelihood of the relevance of what we do this week to your practice of architecture in the future. What question did you write as a target question? Yes, Jess. No, I don't have to say that. But you don't have to. I guess one of my questions would be, you know, from what we read, how is that correspond to like self building? I know the part that he might have had it wasn't a self neighborhood, like they were homes already. Like it's not like. So it was a formal neighborhood. It was a formally produced. What neighborhood was it? Um, so what country was it in? I've not Turkey. Turkey. So, um, that the land title was falsified. But they still had to pay taxes on it. Right. Okay. Okay. That's a good one. What is our place in the previous? Other questions? I'm never going to practice in any of these places. Why do I, what, what does it do have to help my career if I'm never going to practice in any of these other places? Right? Is that fair, Kayla? Other questions? You trust me? to cover 
things that you find useful without. Okay. Makes me a little nervous, but uh, let's see how that works. If you have questions along the way, feel free. So in a compressed time frame, seven topics. First one is planetary urbanization. In the past 15 years, uh, professors, especially those professors over at Harvard University, have asserted a theory. The theory goes something like this. We used to talk about how uh, cities were um, something that was important to about 10% of the human population. And then as agriculture became less important, more and more people moved to the city, then we said urbanism, urban design, urbanization were experiences that 30% of the human population were experienced. And we're just not talking about the other 70%. Well, fast forward to 2010, where we hit the 50% mark. 50% of the world's population lives in places categorized as urban. And uh, we get together every year in these conferences and we talk about what is there, what is, let's define what urban even means. And an interesting thing happened. And long story short, the decision was, listen, we are all interconnected now. The way it used to be that you'd have to move to the, the nearby city of Chicago. You'd have to move to Chicago to experience that level of connectedness or Kansas City or St. Louis or Topeka, right? You'd have to go to a place where a lot of people live they have newspapers, they have stores that sell lots of they have specialty stores, they have transportation systems so you can actually get around and talk to a lot of different people. That's the essence of what a city is. You run into people that you have not known your whole life. There's anonymity. The experience of anonymity was identified hundreds of years ago as one of the core uh, components of what it means to live in a city, to be urbanized, to be an urbanite. And somewhere around the same time uh, the United Nations was declaring, uh, we are now a majority urban population world, the human species. Uh, these colleagues of mine were identifying, let's just cut to the chase here. We have the internet now. If we're connected to each other instantaneously with such ease, isn't that the essence of what makes for life of an urban, an urban experience? And so uh, especially um, these two writers, one of whom was at Harvard at the time, just put forward this idea of planetary urbanization. We are all, city dwellers now because we are so connected and there is no place on the planet that is not part of this urbanizing network you don't need a subway system to be part of an urban experience of life we order things from amazon we uh, consume our media uh, across these networks that without limits we are all urban now. Does that make sense? You okay with that? Do you object? Yeah. Wow. 
but I live on a farm and to get to the doctor, I got to drive three hours. How does that mean burdens? Well, COVID times. I, I, I have my therapy visits with someone in Chicago, even though I live in, you know, uh, I live three hours from Topeka. But when I don't like my therapist in Chicago, uh, I can fire her and start seeing the therapist from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Canada. As long as they speak and share a common language, the whole world is my medical network, right? And the time zone works. So especially after COVID, there's something about this planetary urbanization that it's not the same to live on a farm as it is to live in Boston, but there are certain similarities that didn't exist prior. Yeah. Fair to say that there's a difference between built environments, urbanization versus like the urbanization that the internet brings. Yes. Because there's like a, a good example I was thinking of is like when Uber Eats or DoorDash, even when all first came out, they were very focused in like Silicon Valley and even in Boston, they were sort of being sprawling out that quickly. Mm -hmm. Until much later on, so I just think that there's a big problem feeling that there's a discrepancy between the built environment uh, of how you do urbanization and the physical fabric yeah. versus the digital network. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. there are still some things that you can't be gone. It's like stuff like you need some sort of real human interaction. Yeah, and this is perfect. This is the the discussion that happens when these groups get together. Although increasingly, we don't talk about that anymore at these conferences. We just say, it's not the same. We acknowledge the difference between living on a farm three hours from Topeka and living in Chicago or Boston. We acknowledge those differences. At the same time, we acknowledge that the world has been flattened a bit. The, uh, because uh, smartphones are in every village in Africa and every town in, in, in the world now. So, uh, and they're a lot cheaper than what you thought. A lot cheaper. Um, sorry about that. And uh, so it's just kind of, it's a complicated situation. And so we use this idea of planetary urbanization as shorthand for how connected we are. But as we will see, yeah, this is the slide that goes with that 2010 turning point of urban population. Um, we're not just uh, interconnected in our digital fabrics, but we also move. We move around the world in ways that previously we were not able to do. It was unthinkable for Afghan refugees to make their way to Brazil and then work their way through Brazil to Colombia, across the jungles of the Darien Gap, up through Belize and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Mexico and arrive at the US border and present themselves for asylum. Like, that's a big trip. That was not something we had before. We didn't have Somalis showing up on boats in the islands of Greece, trying to make it to Berlin, where so many Somalis have made it, or to Maine, Lewis, Lewisboro, Maine? Lewiston. Lewiston, Maine. You know, this is not, or Lowell, Massachusetts, this is a new condition where people are uh, being pushed off the land that they grew up on, and they find themselves in entirely new parts of the world. It's, this is great. Um, I, and I mentioned this to some of the people last Tuesday, that if we are, just a few months ago, we passed 8 billion. Congratulations. <clears throat> 8 billion people. Of those 8 billion, 
about 1 billion live in self-produced neighborhoods. We're shooting very quickly, as we keep saying, to 11 billion. And of those 11 billion, somewhere between three and four billion, our actions as designers will have an impact on how close to three or how close to four we end up. So that variation is kind of where we come in. Uh, by around the year, you know, about the time you're getting ready to retire at the age of 95, um, you will be approaching the three to four billion uh, residents of self built communities. Um, okay. So you'll notice <clears throat> that it accounts for all of that increase. Isn't that, it could possibly account for every human added to the population is gonna be living in, in these conditions that we're talking about this week. How is that possible? Well, here's how it's possible. Japan and Italy have already experienced this. Um, they're, they're experiencing population decline. Their populations are dropping. If not for immigration, the United States population would decline. Is that a good thing? It's a good thing, right, for the planet? Yeah, I guess it's a good thing for the planet. But what's China doing? They used to have a one-child policy. They used to say, uh, if you have a second child, we will put you in jail. And it was a deterrent to having more children. China has changed its tune. Now they're incentivizing educated parents to have as many children as they can. Why would China do that? Why would Italy be in a panic? Why would Japan uh, be thinking the unthinkable? Because Japan is one of the most xenophobic that means fear of outsiders. One of the most xenophobic societies in the world, they're even thinking about immigration. They're thinking about this because when people immigrate from other countries, they're not, we don't get the elderly and the disabled. We get the sharpest thinkers, the most capable people, the, the most entrepreneurial characters who are coming to the United States to start new lives, they're gonna make so much money that they're gonna be sending, well, maybe they're not, to them, it's gonna seem like a lot of money. I was a doctor in Brazil, but I'm coming to the United States and I'm gonna work as a property you know, maintenance worker because it's better money, it's more secure. And I'm gonna live in Somerville, I'm gonna share an apartment with many other people and I'm gonna send home thousands of dollars a month, which is a fortune. It doesn't sound like much money to us. We're paying that, you know, much more than that intuition cost. But I'm going to send money home to Brazil, and it's going to support the 17 people in my extended family. These people are the sharpest, most capable, most able, and they're the movers and shakers of Brazilian society or Syrian society or fill in the blank. And they're coming to this country, they're making money, and they're supporting the social security system, they're supporting the tax system, they're supporting the housing market, and our economy would be a lot worse off. We'd be more like Japan or Italy if, if we had closed borders. Question over here. Stephanie, did you have a question? Okay. So... The population of, of the formal world is declining while the population of Asia continues to grow, even though they've reached a replacement rate. Um, it has to do with uh, the arithmetic of demographic statistics. Um, but the place where the, the question mark is, are we going to hit, are we going to hit 9 billion? Or 10 billion or 11 billion or 12 billion, that question mark is right here. It's all about Africa. That's the question. 
the rest, you know, a, a, at least a billion and a half or so is already baked into the system of Asia. The, the, the birth rate has already declined, but because there are so many young families giving birth, uh, this will contribute about one and a half billion to this increase. The question is, what's going to happen in Africa? And what can be what can you do? Can you do what China did and set a one-child policy? I guess you could, but it's kind of violent and ugly and horrible human rights crisis. It turns out that the thing that makes a difference, and I've said this in the first lecture of the course, is women and girls' education. When women and girls go to school, become educated, they are they gain control over their reproductive rights. And that's when the population uh, gets in greater control. They're not forced into childbearing. And that's the question in Africa. Why are you saying that it's only their education and it's not just part of their culture? Because in Africa, in order like to be seen as wealthy, like, to be a part of that culture is having a big family. It's having that support system so that when you end up getting older, like they take care of you. I don't know. So I don't think it's fair to say that like- Oh, but this is what, the, I don't know why, but this is what the literature tells us. It's it's documented. This is- What literature? I don't when the UN, all literature. So when the UN has this conversation, that's the conversation. It's about women and girls' education. And when they ask, when they say, we need to address this, they don't say we need to change their culture. They say we need to invest in women and girls' education throughout the African continent. But they're addressing it from a developing country's point of view, not from an underdeveloped country's point of view. Who's that? The UN. Well, the UN is working. Yeah, but the UN is just, all these countries. They're also just people sitting in offices. Yeah, okay. They're not people. We're getting into offices. the weeds. I'm just trying to help lay the background for the topic. We don't have to go deep into that. But if if you want to help me understand it better, I welcome that. Joe. Uh, my problem is that you can do, but why is it on women education instead of Not. changing race culture? Because that's what a lot of people <laughs> And it feels like by the way that you're presenting this, that this big problem is women being uneducated when in reality, a lot of these women don't have a choice. I apologize for any implication that this is the responsibility of women. It's not. It's, it's decisions like the Taliban closing the, the girls' schools, the Taliban uh, making it illegal for women to be seen in public. It's that type of repressive culture, whether it's Muslim extremism or something else, any fill in the blank. When women's rights are curtailed, they lose the ability to assert their autonomy, their bodily autonomy, and they are coerced into childbearing. That's just the history of the last several decades of what makes a difference. Yeah. So one of the, I was born and raised in West Africa, San Diego. I can tell that there's lots of what you say, what you say in common. So a lot to do with culture and religion as well. So women in Africa do not have much right and much freedom. So but not know, all of Africa. It's very it's, it's very localized. Yeah. And it's very important being a country where it's bitter is for them to right. Yeah. Imagine. You have to say a trigger warning before we talk about it, you know. So yeah, it varies like it's not true in Senegal, is it? it, it it's, or the Gambia, I guess, right there next. Gambia is a world apart from Senegal. Yeah. So the rights are localized. And the way, the way we talk about countries in general, one of the things we're going to cover in this semester is how the way we used to refer to the third world does not work anymore. The way we used to refer to Africa as if it was a place Africa has 55 distinct nation states, and even within Nigeria alone, or Ghana, or even choose something even smaller, Togo, the experience of life in 
this neighborhood of uh, the city is worlds apart. It's as different as it used to be between the first world and the third world. So we no longer use the term third world because it doesn't work anymore, unless we're time transporting ourselves back in time to the post-war period where there was a third world, that was a useful term, but now it just gets in the way. The first world and the third world has broken up and it exists right here within walking distance of the campus. The conditions that we used to call third world are everywhere. And the conditions we used to call first world are everywhere in every city. And that's why these topics are particularly interesting to us. Um, so the, the big thing that will uh, influence, will, you will face in your careers is the distinction between push forces and pull forces. How many of you came to Boston to go to school? How does that feel? Feels good, right? That's a pull force. That's what a pull force feels like. How many of you have been forced to flee your homes? Push force. What's that like to have to flee your home? Strange, it's putting it mildly. The uh, pull forces is what urbanization was all about uh, for much of European history. People came to the city for jobs. They came to the city for opportunity. It was a positive thing. Uh, but there was also push forces in uh, the 18th century, the laws of enclosure in England. Forest, if you've watched, um, what's the British show? What is it? Downton Abbey. Have you watched Downton Abbey? So they talk about enclosures, even though it's, it's still happening in the 1920s uh, in their history. But uh, there used to be something called called the commons. And that's what we talked about last week as the commons, where uh, people who lived in a village could bring their livestock to graze in the commons. They could also farm land that was considered to be the property of the village. And every uh, resident of the village had the right to farm that land. Uh, in the uh, actually starting much, much earlier. This went over, This happened in England over the course of centuries, but in the 17th and 18th centuries, it became a big push called the laws of enclosure. They took the commons and they put fences around it and they said, this is now private property. So they took shared commons and they transferred it to private property. And uh, then they hired those same farmers to farm the land. Uh, instead of farming it for themselves, they were paid uh, to farm the land. And there wasn't enough work for everybody. So people got displaced, they got pushed. This is the push. So even in England, uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries and on through to the 1920s, as seen in Downton Abbey, farmers were pushed off their land and uh, displaced and they came into cities where, what were the jobs uh, around that time in the cities of England? That's now, that's what we do now. But what did we do then? What was it? Servants, Servants that's what we, yeah, service sector is the big thing now. But in the 18th century, steam power, mill workers, so factory work. It was the rise of the industrial labor factory system. So people were pushed off the land into cities, and that's when you face really difficult situations. You get overcrowding. And so I'm, I'm grounding this whole history to help make it less of an us and them thing. Because often 
uh, places like Wentworth, when we turn our attention to informal settlements, we think of uh, us and them. This is the them thing. Why are you teaching us about a them thing? I'm an us thing. Well, it happens to us too. Um, it happens to all humans. It happened to, uh, to the British throughout British history for the last several centuries. And uh, the thing to, to remember here, if you were doing a takeaway statement for this five minutes of the lecture, the takeaway statement would be pull, being pulled into the city. That's great. Like, we're all here to come to Wentworth. Congratulations, you were pulled into Wentworth. Being pushed into the city, not great, not good. And the way the world has gone and is going, uh, guess which one of these forces is on the increase? We have never had so many internally displaced peoples within countries being pushed out of their homelands of where they've been living for generations and pushed off their lands and into cities, which is a profoundly um, impoverishing move in aggregate. People lose their ability. They lose any wealth they've accumulated and they lose the ability to make money. Um, and so this has uh, become an extreme problem uh, like never before. And uh, it's also in part because of, well, what we used to call, here's another distinction. This belongs in the next takeaway statement if you're doing that, is um, there's man-made disaster. And natural disaster. And um, we used to make that distinction, but it's harder and harder to make that distinction. If you, if you heard of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, You've heard of that? So there was a hurricane. It hit New Orleans. It had pushed the Gulf of Mexico inland. A lot of people were flooded out, displaced. Many people died in those floods. Uh, and it was a disaster. The thing that's not controversial is the word disaster. In the 20th century, we used to call that a natural disaster. It's obviously a natural disaster because the source of the disaster was a hurricane, right? So we said natural disaster. But when Katrina happened, a lot of people said, well, hurricanes happen historically. Why did this hurricane happen? Why was it so big? Uh, well, one answer is that the Gulf of Mexico is rising in temperature, making the severity uh, of storms much more uh, dire. Uh, and so it's not totally a natural disaster. There is a man-made climate change component to this disaster. Then they also looked at why are all these neighborhoods in the uh, below sea level next to Lake Pontchartrain. And the reason that neighborhoods, so many people live in the low, low lying areas that normally people with common sense would not live below sea level next to Lake Pontchartrain. The reason they do is because the US government said, let's, you know, it doesn't make sense for the private market to give ins home insurance to these people. They won't take that risk. So the U.S. government decided to underwrite that risk, making it possible for people, for developers to develop that property that otherwise would not be developed. So it created large neighborhoods and whole towns uh, in the path of flooding. And that's, that's a man-made component. And then the third and perhaps biggest one is for 100 years, uh, engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers had been uh, doing flood prevention canals along the Mississippi River by building very expensive, very big concrete levees all the way down the Mississippi River to prevent the valuable farmland from flooding. And if you do that enough, 
basically you're making a super highway of water. And this is true in cities all over the world that we spend a hundred years or so at great expense building concrete barriers to waterways at, that has prevented some flooding, but it's also increased the volume and velocity of water churning down towards uh, the oceans. And it can cause, it's actually uh, increased the frequency and severity of flooding downstream. That was uh, a major component of why the canal walls were breached in the city of New Orleans in 2005 during Hurricane Katrina. So we look back and we say natural disaster or man-made disaster. And we say, it's a disaster, there's, there's gonna be a man-made component and a natural component. This is part of life in the Anthropocene that the reality is, is that there is no more wilderness area in the world. There's no more, increasingly architects and designers are referring to uh, uh -huh. nature as a local force Nature is no longer a place. Name a place that you think is nature. Northern Siberia, we're up by the Arctic Circle. Um, that area, it has. Uh, plastics in the water. It has uh, sulfur in the air. The carbon content of the air has been altered. Um, the footprint of humans has reached those areas. Uh, it's been altered uh, from its natural state. It has nature in it. It's a local phenomenon. There are polar bears. Polar bears are natural. But the place itself is no longer unaltered it's part of and by this token it's kind of like planetary urbanization we now refer to the built environment the human footprint of the built environment is everywhere on the planet and starting to be uh, the atmosphere is littered with tens of thousands of uh, abandoned satellites and space trash, and we're starting the process on the moon and Mars and elsewhere. So, so the way we talk about nature is different now. Even wilderness uh, zones are altered by the fact that they're enclosed. The animals no longer have the same migratory freedom that they once had because it's been declared a wilderness zone, is simply by declaring it and demarcating it the way we have, or even if there's no fence, there is built up development around the perimeters of these wilderness zones that alter uh, the, what is possible within those wilderness zones, okay? But these, um, the disasters that the world is experiencing are increasingly severe, uh, increasingly identifiably uh, human created, and uh, it's implicated in warfare. That the Syrian war that you may have heard of, the Syrian civil war, would not be occurring the way it has occurred if not for a drought that occurred prior to the Syrian civil war. Uh, so global climate change is increasingly a trigger to these man-made and so-called what we would have previously called natural disasters, including warfare. And so with the increase of all of these forces, what we're seeing is world record breaking for the first time in history, um, the greatest numbers of displaced populations in the world. And where these people end up, increasingly are refugee camps. And these refugee camps are the second topic of the lecture. Um, 
we look back at what you studied in history theory one is the Roman camp. Uh, you will recall, and we'll be looking at Roman camps uh, later in the semester when we move back in history, back to the Roman uh, thing, the Roman project of settling the Mediterranean world. Uh, but the, the key instrument that we'll be looking at when we get to the Roman Empire is urban form and as a as kind of a, a vehicle for controlling places. They, they basically took these plans and moved it from place to place um, and built Roman camps that then became Florence and then became London, then became the cities of Europe. So at the core of all of these, our favorite vacation places in Europe is a, a, a Roman core. And it's the same story uh, 2000 years later with refugees that the, the Roman camp model was the basis for the concentration camps of uh, World War II, Nazi Germany, and the basis for refugee camps to the present. This one uh, is clear that um, it's an isolated experience. This is what happens over decades and decades of growth. It starts to take on the characteristics of a city. But fast forwarding, the, the example that uh, we find most compelling here is Beirut, Lebanon, that uh, some research of a colleague has developed this kind of mosaic patchwork that reveals that the city of Beirut is really the agglomeration of different waves of push. People pushed off the land into the cities and towns. They, find, they end up in Beirut, Lebanon, which is part of its, its neighbors are Syria and Israel and Jordan. Uh, it's in a part of the world that has been unstable, uh, destabilized by warfare in the past century. And so every time there's uh, the next every with every outbreak of violence, there's another significant uh, growth of population uh, in a part of town that had previously not been settled. And one of the realities of this, and several students in the past few years have made this the focus of their thesis project, is that we can set up refugee camps as if they're temporary. And we continue to do that, we as in the United Nations. But we can also acknowledge the fact that history tells us that these things are not temporary all the time. They actually, most of the time, they end up being the course of new urban uh, agglomerations. And that's the story that is demonstrated in Beirut. You can see from the air, the texture of the neighborhoods tells you which ones were developed according to zoning codes and certain minimum standards, and which portions of Beirut uh, grew spontaneously through self-production out of the tents that were originally set up as refugee camps. And really some interesting thesis projects uh, coming out of Wentworth where students are anticipating urbanization uh, in the design of the layout of what starts out as tents. And they design beautiful fabric structures uh, that have uh, abundant amenities and establish the core of well-functioning urban arrangements, uh, anticipating that this population is not going back home anytime soon, just in case. We, that's still plan A, is to go back and pick up where we left off without, with the minimum of losses. But just in case, what if we were gonna be stuck here from now on, what would that, what would it be like? to have all the things we need. Which brings us to uh, the next definition. Um, we read in the reading about uh, 
UN Habitat, which has its headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya, in Sub-Saharan Africa. UN Habitat published uh, standards, <clears throat> and these standards identify what at the time was called a slum. We don't use the word slum anymore. We don't even use the word informal settlement as much as we can. So you mentioned the example of the not, and so after the explosion, how does it take the city to rebuild? For example, the, the example of Beirut, like after the explosion. Well, Beirut is is exceptional. I, I I don't think you can take the Beirut example and apply it elsewhere, because Beirut itself was not just uh, the repository of refugees. Is coming. It's also been the focal point of several waves of devastating violence. And but the energy of the people of Beirut is really incomparable. And uh, the politicians uh, seem to uh, thrive on the challenge of recovering from these episodes. They get they say we're going to rebuild and we're going to make it better than ever. They get elected and they actually do rebuild and make it better than ever. And actually, the man who uh, off, who gave me all this material, he was an MIT uh, graduate who taught this course with me. He co-taught the course. He gave me all his materials. Then he went right away. He told me while he was teaching the course, I'm going to go back to Beirut and I'm going to run for public office. So he's a politician in Beirut, and uh, I'm, I should check in to his Facebook page and see what's happening. So how long do you think it takes to do what you about? So fast, like 10 years from, I can't remember what year that was so devastating. If I had more time and more uh, real estate in the slideshow, I'd be showing you pictures of the new mosque and the new church, you know, side by side, you know, to try to use urban form as a vehicle for reconciling these differences. And maybe in future week, that would be a good analysis. But this is kind of a very clear demonstration, thanks for asking, of how people trained as architects, uh, people who Someone specifically who taught this course is using urban form and architecture as a vehicle for transforming his society back in Beirut. So if you were interested in writing things down, uh, there's nothing like having concrete numbers, right? So there are five attributes of informality. And if a place uh, checks off three of those five, then they're considered by UN Habitat, not me, UN Habitat. This is their standards. This is the kind of thing that uh, 20 years from now, I would want this knowledge on a team if we faced something like this, like maybe we're given a commission to expand the campus in Nairobi or some, or some other place. Uh, we'd have to talk openly about what, uh, what neighborhoods are considered what we now call and what we'll probably call in 2030 or 2050 uh, self-produced neighborhoods. So the first thing uh, that you need to be okay and not a slum is you need secure land rights. And I referred to this last Tuesday. Um, uh, when the comment that was shared was people need to be educated so that they understand the importance of having proper sanitary facilities, good toilets that go to septic tanks or septic systems so that uh, human waste does not pollute the environment and put at risk sources of drinking water. We need to educate people of that. And I said, Believe it or not, people get it. Everyone knows this. It's the number one rule that parents teach their children at an early age. Uh, friends don't let friends, uh, what's the technical term? 
um, excrete where they anywhere near they eat, right? You excrete there, you eat here. You excrete there, you get your water supply from here. You keep those things separate. Everyone knows that. The reason bad sanitation exists is because why invest all the money and effort it takes to build proper sanitation facilities if we're going to get kicked off the land in a week or a month or a year or without any warning. So it turns out that this is number one for a reason. If you can't do anything else, you just do this one and the other things uh, will tend to fall into place. But if you don't have security of land rights, uh, then you're in trouble. And the other things are probably not gonna happen. And once you have security of land rights, people will do what they can to get access to safe drinking water. The unfortunate story is that when people don't have access to municipal water supplies that are clean enough to boil and then drink, because believe it or not, majority of the world's population do not drink the water that comes out of the tap. We boil it first, then we drink it, because there's a lot of stuff that gets in there. It's the exception to the rule that you can consume the water straight out of the tap. So count your blessings. Um, but for the communities that don't have access to municipal water supplies that they can boil and then consume, they actually end up paying more. Isn't that crazy? They pay more for their water. A, a truck comes by and uh, once a week or once a day or once a, you know every two weeks and they sell water from a hose and it costs much more than the cost of doing this. And it's not, this is not free. It's not free um, in the United States either. It's paid for through um, water bills. And directly related to that is sanitation. The less control we have over uh, where the uh, bad water, the black water and gray water goes, uh, the more likely it is that we don't have a safe drinking water supply. So that's number three. Number four, adequate residential space. How big is five square meters? Sixteen square feet, is that right? That would be like this. So next. Five square meters, here's the rule of thumb for those of you who don't speak meter. Um, take five meters, bring down to five, five square meters, and it's true. Well, five square meters, bring down to five, add a zero. And that's five, 50 square feet. Got it? You got it? So five square meters, how big is that? Is this all right. So that's a pretty good bedroom, isn't it? It's not bad. I've I rented actually it was employee housing. But I shared a room about that size when I was working as a um, employee housing. But that's not what it is. It's 50 square feet in total. So all the shared space, my share of the share of the kitchen, my share of the living room. Uh, it's like 10 of us sharing a uh, 500 square foot apartment where we each have 50 square feet. So the bedroom is actually significantly small. So that's pretty small. Even when you're renting in Brighton and Alston, it's better than that. Was that number five? Okay. So uh, we're running low on time. Uh, this is Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, 
a lot of the, this is the work of Ignacio Cardona, everybody's favorite, newest colleague. Well, except for NJ, we love them both dearly. Um, Dr. Cardona's research is, uh, the focus of it is on figuring out what really is informality. And he did this brilliant analysis that looked at uh, to what extent were the elements that contributed to these houses in Venezuela, in Caracas, in the self-produced neighborhoods. What percentage was e illegally obtained? What percentage was self-built? What percentage uh, was under the table the government had no knowledge of? Um, and how much of it was formal? It turns out that when we build in Patare Norte in Caracas, Venezuela, we don't just go build it ourselves. We hire someone who is a builder who knows what they're doing. And then me and my extended family, and my neighbors and my friends, we are the labor and the, the professional builder is the one who directs the work. And so we put rebar in the footings. We're not self-destructive. If we're gonna build a home and live in it, we want it to not slide down these steep slopes. We want it to be earthquake resistant. We don't want it to be a bad place to live. So we would never build in wood. Wood is for peasants and people in the United States and some really nice houses in Japan. But no self-respecting uh, citizen of the rest of the world would ever invest in a home that wasn't made out of steel reinforced concrete frame with brick or cinder block infill. The houses in these so-called slums are built to a higher standard than the houses uh, people grow up in the wealthiest communities in the United States. They don't burn down, they don't rot, they don't get infested by insects. The only thing that happens is when someone builds it who's a crook, they use cheaper uh, Portland cement or they skimp on the Portland cement so the concrete frame fails in compression. And we usually don't find out until there's an earthquake like we did in China. Or they leave out the most expensive thing of all, which is the steel. You leave out the steel, you skimp on the Portland cement and your house is gonna cr crumble. Short of that, it's a pretty solid structure. It's so solid, what was in the reading? That people build their homes with the help of a professional builder. Thank you very much. Then when they save up enough money and materials, they say, okay, let's put a second floor on it. And they build a second floor. Then what do they do? That's good for them. But now I, my kids want to go to school and school costs money. Even public school costs money. So what do I do? What do they do in the reading? They sell the rights to the roof. They sell their roof rights. So they sell their roof rights to a friend or a stranger, and they come and they build, they build another story on it. And then what happens when they have another child? And they want to send that child to, to school, not to college, to school. They sell their roof rights. What's up with that? How can you keep stacking them up? Steel reinforced concrete frame construction with solid footings, you can do it. So you get five, six story structures that you can't do with wood frame construction in the United States until you have mass timber. Isn't that interesting? So, um, so one of the themes that we're not going to give effective coverage to is the phenomena of financialization of property. So I'm gonna give you the takeaway with some pretty startling images. 
And Wentworth students went here. I took a group of Wentworth students. Does anyone know where this is? Probably says, right? Dubai. Yeah. Brilliant. You, you recognize it. Um, yeah, so this is the skyline of Dubai. I get that in Boston, you know, a lot of people take the train to Park Street, and a lot of people walk or, you know, they don't drive because it's so dense. So a lot of people get to work by means other than driving. And some, for some reason, it's important to be like near downtown crossing. So the value of the land by downtown crossing is very high. And like Chicago with the first skyscrapers, remember history 32, the first skyscrapers were justified by the high value of land in Chicago in the loop. And so it just made sense with the invention of the elevator, the uh, discovery of the structural properties of steel reinforced concrete frames and steel frames that they just built high in Chicago. The skyscraper was born out of the scarcity of land at the center of cities. So <clears throat> same as Dubai, right? It's the same thing. But wait, in 1970, Dubai was a fishing village with a population of about 20,000 people. 1970, that wasn't that long ago, right? What up with that? And surrounding Dubai, what is, what's there? It's a desert. How big is that desert? Is there any end to that desert? It's big. And how do the people get around in Dubai? Cars. Famously, the police officers drive around in Lamborghinis. Um, so there's no property scarcity. There's no population push. Why Dubai? Why is Dubai? What's going on in Dubai? It turns out that it is a real estate speculation city that when a nation's sovereign wealth funds or uh, some other investor wants to invest, uh, wants to diversify, if you had $10 million, we would be sitting down as your financial advisor. I'll take 10% of them from the game. Thank you very much. And I would advise that you diversify your holdings. Stocks are doing great. This is free advice for all of those in the investor class. Um, stocks is, is the big game, but it's high risk. You want to diversify your holdings. So take about 20 or 30% of your investment value and put it into real estate. And it's difficult to track your real estate unless you put it in a single entity like a building. So it turns out that the height of the buildings is determined by the size of the investment that any given investor wants to sink into it. And when the Saudi family, uh, no, it wasn't the Saudis, they wanted to um, put all of their investment, their real estate portion of their investment in a single building. That's why the Burj Khalifa exists. It's not from demand. It's, uh, it's not from conventional demand that we think we're trained to design for, to satisfy people's need for housing and schools and classrooms and offices. This is demand uh, that is related solely to investment returns. <clears throat> so you see the surrounding landscape is more or less empty uh, because people get around mostly by car that they could just drive a little bit further and have a two-story or a one-story facility, but instead they go up. And because it adds to the exchange value uh, this is the point. And why are we learning about Dubai? Because that has nothing to do with us here. But look at one Dalton place. Every city in the world currently has <clears throat> a luxury condominium building boom. And that building boom is being driven by purchasers who use shell corporations to purchase the most expensive units. And the more expensive the unit, the better it is for the investment. And we use a shell corporation to cloak the identity of the actual investor. 
And if you look uh, in the winter months as the sun goes down earlier and earlier, but it's seven at night when people should be home cooking dinner, if you look at the windows of One Dalton Place, and some of them have light in them, sure, but the higher you go in the building, the darker it is because more and more of those units are investment only properties. It turns out that last year, one out of every four property that was purchased in the United States, home, one out of every four home purchases in the United States was a purchase by uh, an investor without the intention of living. Why are rents so high, including the dormitories of Wentworth campus? Because so much of the supply is being now consumed by investors that more or less take those units off the market, even if they rent those units, uh, which some of them do, they're, it's, it's artificially inflating the cost of housing. And when the, the center of the town, like down at downtown crossing, that's called the 100% corner. That's where you put your Rolex watch shop next to the Starbucks. It's the highest value per square foot of real estate. When the value, when, in, when a luxury condo sells at the top of one Dalton place, it pulls this up higher and it, it hits even those apartments on Mission Hill. The rent goes up in those apartments in Mission Hill and on Wentworth campus. And this is what, and did the, did the dormitory in Wentworth or did the apartment in, in Mission Hill just get better? It did not get better. But the market forces just made it more expensive and more profitable for the owners. So this is called, this is why there is a housing crisis. This is a big part of the forces. This is called a market failure from the perspective of supplying housing. But it is a market success from the point of view of investment. So there's a conflict between what we need our economic system to do. And that's what uh, the article that I'd like to share with you on the urbanism WhatsApp is all about. Why, how did we get in this situation in the United States? Is there an alternative? Turns out this example in Vienna, Austria, is a powerful a model that we in the United States, we were pursuing this model during that period I referred to as uh, the 1930s and 40s, uh, the New Deal. The US invented the system that would have produced housing that was affordable, and, uh, but it got negotiated away. And so public housing in the United States more or less collapsed. But other countries took that model that we were considering but didn't do, they did it. And this article in the New York Times is all about where we are now in the United States compared with where we could have been had we done what Vienna, Austria did in terms of investing in very high quality uh, housing. Pretty nice. 800 dollars a month who wants who wants a piece of that 800 dollars a month the average rental cost of a unit in the united states hit this past year hit two thousand dollars a month and it's never been so high in comparison with incomes and so it, it leaves us i have one minute i'm gonna the key question the assumption throughout human history for economics is if this is the income, let's say this is uh, adjusted for inflation, the income of American workers keeps going up. Uh, but the thing that's really strange is for 
our history, housing costs have kind of gone more or less equal because how do you raise housing costs is beyond, you know, faster than people's income? There's no one to buy it, right? So anytime you go too far above what, what people can afford, there's a, the markets will correct. Since the 1970s, that's not happening. And that's why you feel a little panicky about your ability to uh, pay off your student loans and make a living and, and do everything you need to do as you graduate and move into your careers. It's because the connection between housing costs and income have become disconnected and housing costs have just taken off on its own as if it's totally unrelated. So that leaves us with target questions for this coming week. What's up with that? Okay, thank you everyone.